my spooky friends. This is John, and I'm your host. And welcome to another episode of Dairyland Frights, the paranormal podcast that covers everything spooky, creepy, and mysterious in the Midwest. And back by popular demand, <laughs> we did a show earlier this year with Rissa, and she is with Tea and Smoke. And I'm going to let Rissa explain what she does and everything because she's all i can say is she's an amazing person i love to have her on anytime i can get her i'm a little selfish that way let's keep it between us <laughs> but again she check her out i'll let her talk a little bit about you know some events she has coming up a little bit about her website and then we will get right into our topic so Rissa, thank you so much Thank you so much, John, for having me back to your podcast. It's absolutely a pleasure. Yeah, I, I just I I was just like telling us uh you offline that this is one we did a little earlier episode, I believe in January, mm -hmm. was one of the most downloaded episodes, and I got some nice comments about it. So I was like, oh, I gotta have her back on. And also I've been following, not stalking, following <laughs> to see what things she does and she just has done some amazing things uh continues to do amazing things so why don't you talk a little bit about that first before okay. we get into the topic so my spooky friends can check you out and see what what they want to take a look at absolutely so my website that you know me from is tea and smoke.com it is a website where I talk about my divination practices, which are tea leaf reading, smoke reading, tarot, and crystal casting. I do public events, but I also do private readings. In fact, most of my clients are virtual. So I have that on that website, but also all of my talks and tours and speeches that I offer as well. I talk about all sorts of esoteric topics. I'm also a guild certified herbalist, so I do I wear a lot of different hats and dark history is definitely one of my favorite areas to talk about. I am a ghost tour guide in two states and can you tell I love it? And um, yeah, I also love to research things like history of witches and history of superstitions. And I do a lot of just general research. I'm going into the fall and presenting some new programs this year. I was really excited to roll out a collaboration with one of my colleagues called Grave Obsessions, and it was mm -hmm. all about Victorian mourning customs. Mm -hmm. It was a sold-out presentation at a museum here in Maryland, and we awesome. had a great time with it. It was really spooky and all true. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best when it's when it's creepy, spooky, or mysterious, like I was saying in my you know introduction here, and it's true. And all <laughs> right? true, all real, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome and you know one of the things too is i highly recommend to go to rissa's website and like she does like you know if you have some questions or even if you're even if you're a little bit skeptical and you're like oh, i don't know just hey reach out to you right and you can yeah talk about you know what's going on and what you can do and uh, and Nine times out of 10, you're going to be like, yeah, this is awesome. Let's go ahead with whatever, you know, the person would love to do because she's such an amazing person. I say that you know, a lot of times, but it's true. And she's going to give you, she's not, you know, again, when I've talked to other mediums too, not to hit this too hard, it's a lot of people do are skeptical about things, but in really you want to help people any way you can. And if you can't, you want to maybe point them in the right direction. Of maybe you're not the person to help them, but maybe there's something you can show them or get to them that they can use, you know, to wherever they're at in their life, you know, and everyone's well, different. Yeah. Ultimately, John, I think that it, when I'm doing readings, it has to be a team effort. Um, oh, that's true. And it's kind of, I've had people come to me as skeptics and they don't usually get a very good reading because they're not willing to open up to me. Mm -hmm. But if someone is skeptical, I would always say, you know, if you're going to try, you're going to play test the psychic, which is a game that all psychics uh, are have played from time to time. 
Yeah, absolutely. Be aware that you are going into it with a closed mind. It's kind of like going into an art museum and declaring before you get there that you don't like art. You're not going to have fun. You're not going to enjoy it. And something that might have opened up for you probably won't because you've already decided that you don't like it. So, you know, the same with if you're going to take a ghost tour, if you've already decided that you don't like it, you're not going to enjoy any part of it, including the fact that most ghost tours are at least 75 percent history. It's just really interesting. Yeah. And for my spooky friends who listen in Maryland, and there are a bunch of them out there, (laughs) please check out out Arissa's again's website to see dates coming up, times when you can go and see the ghost tour. And obviously you have where with your newsletter, probably be the best way. Yeah. I always have to sign up for that. Yeah. Sign up for that. That way, if you're like, Oh, I don't know what to do this weekend. Or, you know, it's getting a little spookier out there, getting into fall season. You're like, hey, I need something to do. Have a little fun. And here's the greatest part. Because I love history. If you are into history like myself and like Rissa, you have to do this. I mean, <laughs> if I was in Maryland, I would be like your number one fan coming out there as much as I could because I love it. And the great thing about it is too is you're learning something so it's like it's for everybody and i don't say that lightly because you know a lot of people like to sell you know whatever but i'm like if you love history check if you want to be a little scared check if you just want to be out with someone who loves what they do check i mean come on (laughs) it's it's really easy and is there any way else if they have a, if someone else, my spooky friends out there in Maryland, is there anything else that they could do to reach out to you? You know, other than probably the newsletter is the best. Anything newsletter is great. I do have Instagram and Facebook and YouTube, so people can follow me on those and catch up with what I'm doing there as well. Yes, and the other thing I love about it too is she dresses up. So she just doesn't show up in like a sweatshirt and jeans. <laughs> no, never. I always dress the part. I think it's part of the experience. Yeah. And that's what it is. It's a great experience because really I've been to 15 ghost walks and, and I would say more than half were disappointing. But oh, the no. ones that I, I would say that I truly enjoyed were the where people dressed up people love what they do people were super interesting and just you just could tell like it it wasn't just like i don't know a side hustle i don't know if that's the right thing to use but you know what i'm saying yeah you know know. it's just that right and no so you're not going to get that with rissa so unless there's anything else you want to bring up i let's get into the topic shall we that sounds great yeah so today's topic my spooky friends is and i love this because i'm superstitious i admit it (laughs) only people are john and a lot of folks will say i'm not superstitious and then i'll watch them you know knock on wood and i'm like are you sure (laughs) (laughs) and here we are the 21st century you know we're no longer sitting in our huts you know praying for rain and if it thunders out we think the gods are angry with us or if there's drought we think that we sinned against the gods we're like literally have a supercomputer in our phone (laughs) that 50 years ago or even longer than that you know you had an entire room right (laughs) to even figure out what's two plus two now all this information that's out there we have the ability to say i don't know about superstitions but, Rissa, if we were talking offline, is people still believe in them, and I think you do too. So I'll let you start uh, on superstitions and start talking on them. Thank you so much. And thank you for asking me to do this topic. It is one of my favorite things to sort of tilt sideways because superstitions are belief, and they are a huge part of the human condition. There's just no two ways to look at it. No. Belief yeah. rules how we live and superstitions, things like knocking on wood <laughs> or blowing out birthday candles are absolutely part of the human condition. I mean, for example, have you ever seen a dog or cat do those things? You haven't. 
No. Because <laughs> animals don't hold superstitions that we know of, I guess, in the ways that human beings do. And so the other thing to know, a superstition is not provable. No matter how many people swear it's true, uh, to be classified as a superstition, a belief must be unprovable. There is no science behind anything we're going to talk about. <laughs> No science can prove any of this because it's simply belief. It exists only in the realm of storytelling and it only has as much power as people choose to give it. Absolutely. Which is kind of a fascinating thing to think about. And people feel, you know, superstitions have this supernatural element a lot. And, you know, there's consequences of superstitions. Like if you don't blow out all your birthday candles, you won't get your wish, for example. But these are just practices based on belief. Some yeah. There's some superstitions that are very personal, like just in within a family. Uh, mm-hmm. Within my family, we used to have a superstition that if you go to a wedding and you don't eat a piece of the cake, you will have bad luck for a year. I don't know anybody else that held that superstition. Uh, but no. like I said, it was, it was a very small personal superstition. But right. like, as I as I got older, I was like, I don't really love wedding cake. It never tastes good. I'm not going to eat mm. it. Did you, did you ever have a <laughs> did you have a really delicious piece of wedding cake ever? Seriously, Ooh, not that I can think of. Now that sounds no. like a superstition. But yeah. uh, <laughs> but it's the unicorn you're searching for the delicious wedding cake. Yeah, delicious wedding cake. <laughs> yeah. Now you'll have a ton of uh, bakers trying to send you cakes to prove themselves. Right, yeah. I'll get a bunch of emails now from bakers that will be up to our ears in wedding cake and be like, all right, all right. <laughs> but you know how many really dry pieces of wedding cake I ate because of that mm-hmm. superstition? A lot. I don't do it anymore. And actually, I've been to a lot of weddings now that don't even have cakes. They like have pie or other or things. Or cupcakes. Maybe yeah. like a little cupcake or something, yeah. right? Yeah. And, you know, honestly, those are usually pretty good. I'm, I'm here for yeah. these traditions to change. But, oh, absolutely. Um, you know, these beliefs, they can be considered really irrational by non-practitioners. Mm-hmm. And some people say they're like believing in magic or believing in fairy tales. And, you know, it's interesting that superstitious practices rise at different times in history. And we are at a high time right now. The things that lend them, the times I should say that lend themselves to superstition are when there's financial uncertainty, war, or any other kind of turmoil within social groups. So we're, we're in it. We're in a time of financial uncertainty. This is an election year in the United States and people are leaning on superstitions more than ever. So, uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting place to springboard into the first one on our list today. Okay. We're going to start by your request, John, with the death and darkness superstitions. And I love it because I think that's a perfect (laughs) match for your podcast. Thank you. Yeah. The first one that you elected to talk about is called fan death. Now, this Mm. is a very modern superstition. Uh, It doesn't Mm. date back past 2000. And Mm. a lot of folks are surprised to hear that. Because when you think superstition, as some of the ones we'll talk about, go back to like thousands of years BC. This is a new one. So fan death is the belief that having a fan on in your bedroom while you're sleeping with all the doors and windows closed can blow your soul out. <laughs> so That's so interesting. You can find pictures and like illustrations of it online, like warning you not to go to sleep with a fan on. And, you know, what's also interesting is I know a lot of people that like to sleep with a ceiling or a roof fan just for like white noise or. I right hear. I hear. Right? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, John, you probably lost your soul, but that's okay. Please. We can still be friends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you know, it's it's kind of an urban legend as much as a superstition, mm. I think. Because allegedly, you know, your soul leaves your body and it's stuck in the liminal you know, in the liminal world like a ghost. And you're just mm. kind of walking around soulless. I think in other words we call that zombie. But uh, yeah. Some something that zombie likes. So the superstition originated in Korea, and it came from the Korean government putting up advertisements during several summer, summers not to run fans while sleeping to save on power usage. Yeah, and somehow, true. from the signs they created in the ad campaign, fan death became a thing. And it mm. spread through different parts of Asia and eventually moved around the world until people 
even here in the United States, we're kind of convinced that sleeping in a room without any openings with a fan on can blow your soul away. That's so that's so interesting because it, this is then I didn't put it on my list, but like when you say God bless you when you have to sneeze. Yeah. And I don't say it anymore because I think it's utterly ridiculous because everybody knows back. I don't know. Maybe, you know, more than this, uh, obviously you probably do, <laughs> but you know, when you sneezed back in, I don't know, it's probably long time ago, 1500s out of you, supposedly your soul escaped. Yes, and you I said, God, it. God bless you to put it, to put the soul back. I, mm-hmm. I don't know how that works. Well, you know, so typically your heart skips a beat when you sneeze. So oh. that's an interesting bend to that superstition. Hmm. So maybe the God bless you could have evolved over time once we knew that your heart skips a beat when you sneeze. And huh. uh, yeah, so it just it's just a second, right? When you sneeze, yeah. it's very fast. So Correct. yeah, I when I learned that about that particular superstition, I was like, well, that makes a little more sense than losing your soul. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're, we're also going to talk about graveyards and there are superstitions in graveyards that if you don't hold your breath, you can inhale a ghost. Yes. I've been in a lot of graveyards. I probably must have a whole list of companions at this point. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just must have them like, you know, literally like in a room where you got a crowded room where you're like, excuse yeah. me, excuse me, excuse yeah. me. I, I want to go back to the fans really quick. Yeah, of course. Now. Uh, okay. Blowing your, blowing the soul out, like it, it stays forever. Uh, is this a forever thing? It's a forever know? thing. Yeah, it's a really? forever thing. Huh. That's why it's a okay. fan death. Interesting. See, I thought, you know, it's kind of like a battery getting recharged. Like you lose your soul and then, you you know, I don't know. It wanders you do back. Something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of grows back. And then you know, the fan goes away. Huh. That's well, the really story interesting. Is it blows your soul out and your soul gets stuck in the liminal. And as you know, that's kind of how what we classify as a ghost, really. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I have questions about how your body keeps operating, but. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm like, well, you know, not to get off on a tangent here, but one of the things I was talking to one of my guests where, you know, there was a scientist, I believe, in, boy, I'm not even going to bring up the date, but anyway. He believed it's called 21 grams. Yes, that the soul I, I, weighs I'm familiar with 21 that, yeah. Gram. They even made a movie with Sean Penn, Sean Penn. A, yep. a, about it. Because every time, uh, I, I think, either it was, a, and I'm screwing this up, so excuse me, step in anytime you want, <laughs> if I'm totally way off base here. But I think he was a mortician or a doctor. Mm-hmm. And every time, just before someone died, he would weigh, weigh them, I believe. Mm-hmm. And they would That's always tough. weigh... 21 grams less it just kept coming over and over and over and other doctors would say well yeah that's escaping of fluids when you die you evacuate your bowels you might evacuate other fluids so but he was like how can it be the same for everybody like he was getting the same thing men women children same thing same 21 grams and i don't know what happened of that you know but i know some people have said like they have seen a soul escape. They they've been a doctor or a nurse or a police officer or something in that realm where they've seen or have said they see a soul literally escape the body. Mm-hmm. And would you believe that or not? That's a whole thing for you to believe. Uh, but I just uh, <laughs> I don't know. I just can't get past the fan. <laughs> You can't get past the fan blowing your soul away. Yeah, I just can't get past that. That's so interesting to me. Well, you know, we'll talk about mirrors here shortly. But oh, yeah. one of the one of the things with mirrors is that if you sleep in a room with a mirror facing your bed, that you know your soul could leave and cross over mm-hmm. into the mirror. So yeah. that's one one of many. I mean, you could write a whole book about mirror superstitions. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, it's a rich topic, but that's one of the mirror superstitions as well. Yeah. And all of these things have to do with sleep and the soul. And, you know, it almost kind of reminds you a little bit of astral travel, like your soul leaving mm-hmm. at night to travel around. Mm-hmm. I, I was kind of like, I wonder how these things are linked because it feels to me like they must be somehow, mm-hmm. even if it's a subconscious link, you know? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and mirrors, so not to move on here, but if you want to, that's okay. Mirrors fascinate me to, to like, unbelievable because there's been so many stories about mirrors, about oh, yes. seeing yourself or a different self in the mirror, mm -hmm. souls escaping. But, you know, I don't know if this is in your notes, but, Rissa, but, like, with mirrors, where did they get, I believe it's seven years bad luck if you break oh, a mirror. Oh, I have mirror. that. Let's, oh, let's I go, know. Of course let's you do. Let's jump ahead to mirrors. Let's do oh, that. Okay. It seems like a natural segue. All right. Okay. So All right. From Great. The, from the beginning, it's thought that a reflection can contain a soul or a portal to another realm. And that realm could be anything, including the land of the dead. So keep that in mind. Zulu tribes actually started gazing into dark water for reflections. And they felt that if you looked at it too long, it would open the gateway to death. And, you know, sometimes these terrible creatures could come out of the dark reflections, mm -hmm. according to these old tribal legends, and they could steal your soul. There it is. From Ireland to Malaysia, there are lots of beliefs about entities escaping from reflections. And all you have to do is gaze in and look into your own eyes. Mm. So that must be something for our culture to think about, because yeah. mirrors, I mean, everybody alive today grew up with mirrors. We yeah. are, they are totally normal to us, but mirrors yeah. are fairly modern in the world. They, yeah. they did not exist. And even when they first existed, it was for the very wealthy. So to see yourself, you had to gaze into water. Now, Romans and Greeks believed the soul would regenerate every seven years. So that yeah. is the seven years bad luck, right? Basically, yeah. if you break a mirror, you have to wait for your soul to fully regenerate from the time of the break. And hmm. in you know ancient times, just to live another seven years is kind of a big deal because yes. you know, they didn't they didn't have medicine the way we do. Yeah. So that that could be significant to get seven years of bad luck. Yeah. And other people believe that mirrors were actually a device of the gods because they were so hmm. rare and precious. So breaking a mirror definitely would anger the gods and who they would be tormented by the gods. So wow, that so many, that's really. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go say, ahead. <laughs> so a lot of uh, cultures also use mirrors for scrying, which is a kind of divination. And some of them, it had to be like a priest or priestess who would gaze into the mirror or the polished surface. Like in, let's see, South American culture, especially the Mayas, Incas, they used polished obsidian, which was native to those areas. Polished obsidian was used for scrying, and they would gaze into it for visions. And then when mirrors became more prominent throughout parts of Europe, it would be another way to speak to the gods through the mirror. So mirrors yeah. always help everywhere in the world. Now, we've hit three continents. Everywhere in the world, reflection held a really important place within culture. So again, breaking a mirror is, is a, an incredible act of misfortune in every culture. And part yeah. of that is because they were rare and expensive. Most yeah. people could not afford one. And if a mirror can hold a soul, imagine the mental distress of breaking mm -hmm. one. Yeah. It's really no surprise people thought of this as a bad luck kind of thing. Because even a cracked mirror can, if you have a mirror at home with a crack in it, uh, psychologists today say that can distort your view of how you see yourself. Like it can mm. literally change your perception of who you are. I think that's fascinating. So that I was able to find several studies on this when I was doing this research. And people who break mirrors literally see themselves differently, partially because of superstition and partially because of this, the distortion of their yeah. own image. I mean, think okay. of any time, John, you, you see a distorted image, like a carnival mirror, right? Yeah. Where you're like either stretched out or you're squished uh -huh. or you're long or something. Uh -huh. it, it definitely makes you see yourself differently. Now imagine mm -hmm. seeing yourself through a cracked mirror all the time. Mm. It would definitely work on your brain after a while because that's how you see yourself, literally. Yeah, absolutely. There was, this is, when I used to travel a lot for business, I was in Chicago one time and I was in this older hotel which is by it's called i wasn't in the congress plaza hotel which is hella haunted it's it's really we did an episode on that but i was in a different one and they had this huge mirror probably about 
don't know, seven foot tall, mm-hmm. old antique mirror in the in the lobby. And when I walked past it, you know, it just made me feel weird, you know, you know, and I don't know how old that mirror was. Okay. And, you know, being that I love the paranormal, I love history. I mean, it's one of those huge ornate mirrors, you know, with yeah. the wood They're, outlet. Big old mirrors yeah. like that are amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got like lion's heads on it or some crazy stuff. And, it, it, you know, and it, it just, I said, I, I just remember walking past and going, well, this mirror has been here. I don't know, maybe since the 1800s, 1900s, you know, and it's just seen thousands of people walk yes. past it, and right? You got to wonder in a haunted place if somebody's looking out the other side at you. Right, right, right. Or maybe it's trapped some people. Who knows? I don't know. I mean, uh, but mirrors are just something I'm just like, wow. Yeah, <laughs> I was really careful about it. Well, I've got some mirror. more mirror stuff here you might enjoy. Yeah. Like what to All do right. if you break a mirror? Can you yeah. counteract the bad luck charm? And yeah. according to superstition, the answer is yes, you can counteract Ooh. the charm. So if you break a mirror, some ideas, some suggestions, you can walk okay. in a circle three times. You okay. should definitely reuse the broken mirror pieces or toss them into a south running stream. Now, that might take some mm. research wherever you are in the world to find a south running stream to yeah. use it to wipe the mirror pieces off. Now, you need to do any of these things within seven hours to counteract the seven years. Mm. So if you had other plans, cancel them immediately <laughs> and get busy. So yeah. I did read that uh, you can take a single piece of the broken mirror and take it to a graveyard and bury it where spirits can't find it. I'm not sure why they couldn't find it there, but this is the legend. And that will help counteract the bad luck charm or hold on to it until it becomes a full moon and then place it down on the ground and use it to reflect the full moon energy back, cleanse it, and then either Mm. reuse it or bury it somewhere. Mm. So these are a a bunch of different ideas that if any of your listeners break a mirror, they can yeah. try some of these different options or whatever resonates with them to see if they yeah. can reverse the seven year curse. Wow. That's that's really interesting. I didn't know you could do that. I thought you kind of stuck. It certainly wouldn't hurt to try, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You know, let's talk about vampires for a second. All right. I I you know, I have to always take a moment to talk about vampires, right? So sure. vampires and mirrors go together mm. right like peanut butter yeah. and jelly um yeah. <laughs> and if you don't have a soul you won't have a reflection mm-hmm. thus vampires don't have a reflection in mirrors some tellings also witches werewolves and wizards do not have reflections in mirrors and those actually predate the story about the vampires so mm. this is historically because mirrors were lined with silver now, our oh. mirrors today can be made out of like shiny plastic. Um, in fact, yeah, I think right. a lot of them, <laughs> a lot of them probably are. Yeah. But that said, when I'm back when mirrors were expensive and rare, they were literally lined with thin, pounded out sheets of silver that were super mm. polished. And silver is what you use first historically to kill witches, then werewolves, and then vampires mm-hmm. as the stories all progressed. Mm-hmm. So, of course, you know, because you have this pure metal, it's going to repel these dark, evil beings. And that is indeed why vampires don't show up in a mirror. And, of course, we have to talk about Bloody Mary. Yes. Right? Yes. So sorry. Hopefully you can edit out my coughing. Yes. No problem. (laughs) So one more time. I'm sorry. Hopefully we'll get it all out. This is literally me choking on my tea that I just drank. All right. So the story of Bloody Mary is a classic with mirrors. And the thing is, almost every region has its own version of this. Here in Maryland, we have Black Aggie. In Pennsylvania, where I grew up, it's Mary Black. And everybody knows Bloody Mary because she's been on Supernatural. And of course, you know, the three times name chant doesn't always require a mirror like Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Right. So (laughs) the story is that you gaze into a mirror, usually at midnight. Sometimes it doesn't have to be. Sometimes you have to handle it, depending who's telling it. Other times you don't. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or you have to have it completely dark in some tellings of the story. But 
you gaze into the mirror and you say the name three times. And in the story of Bloody Mary, that releases a really dark entity. Now, in mm. my local story, Black Aggie, Black Aggie is actually a statue. Okay. I'm not sure how something is energetically dense as a statue is going to come get you. But, mm, okay. um, <laughs> you know, you know, sure. I didn't write the story. Um, yeah. But then there's other tellings like the Bell Witch in Tennessee. If you do this mm. and say Bell Witch three times, she's going to come get you. Huh. I love the Pennsylvania telling Mary Black decides if you're worthy. She decides if you're worthy of a wish. And if the answer is yes, after you chant her name and invoke her, she sends her familiar, of course, that's a black cat, and lets you know that she's decided to grant your wish. And if she's decided you are unworthy, you get nothing. No. Thanks a lot. <laughs> right? <laughs> but the thing is, these date back at least to the 1700s. I can't find them going back any further, and it could be because mirrors were not widely available before that time. And mm. so they existed, but they weren't widely available. So maybe that's when this tradition, should I call it, game, mm. feels a little risky for a game, but tradition came to be more, more and more common. And nowadays, yeah. of course, everybody's got one of these. They're all over the world. Right. Asia has one for a demon named Paimon. There are just, there are so many of them that fall into this mirror three-time chant category. It's a great mirror story. And uh, have you ever had any other guests that had experience with this? There was one of my guests that said they, when they were a little kid, they did it. And they thought they saw something. And then someone said they got touched. But it, but they admitted they were little kids and they're probably like eight or nine years old and they were just being strange. But I've heard of stories, people doing it and Bloody Mary actually appearing in the mirror and then bad luck befell them. And I don't know if that's the true story, how that works, but that's what I've read and, and heard in some story. So, you know, it could be because mirrors are considered portals. Yeah. And in the tradition of Feng Shui, which is Chinese and over 3,000 years old, you never face two mirrors together because Mm. it creates an energy portal and spirits can come and go and whatever else can come and go as well. And it is also the Feng Shui tradition that I was talking about earlier that you should never place a mirror facing your bed. So... Because, you know, your soul can get confused and end up going through the mirror portal instead of going back to your resting body. Hmm. So that is a super old story. And, you know, the Victorians had an interesting mirror tradition, too. When somebody died in a house, they would cover the mirrors with black drapes because they didn't want the soul to move into one of the mirrors. They wanted the soul to leave, like to go out an open window or the door or something like that. They yeah. didn't want it to stick around and live in one of the mirrors. So all of the mirrors were always covered. And sometimes they say that if you didn't, the mirror itself would tarnish. Remember, these mirrors probably have real silver in them. Yeah. Or the mirror would suddenly become etched with the person's face, which sounds yeah. super eerie and mysterious. Mm. And I would love to see a mirror that was like that. So those are some of the uh, mirror traditions and stories I have. And, oh, you know, this is a weird one. I'm going to share this one before we move on. (laughs) This is an urban legend, probably, but it does date back to the 1700s. So on Halloween night, which is a minute away, but, you know, make a note. If you look into the mirror at midnight on Halloween Mm -hmm. and you can peel an apple in one long, continuous strip, you should toss it over your left shoulder with your right hand. And then your future lover's face will be revealed to you in the mirror. Mm. And if you want them, if you accept, you eat the apple. And if not, you throw it away. (laughs) I love that. Why didn't I think of that? (laughs) Oh, well. (laughs) Too late now. (laughs) So I do have a question about Bloody Mary. If you are old enough to drink, if you drink a Bloody Mary drink while calling a Bloody Mary, like what's going to happen? I'm, you know, 
<laughs> you know, I've never tried it. I, I'm not sure. Mm. I don't think I've ever read about or talked to anyone who's done it either. But I'm going to keep my radar open for that, John. And if I hear, yeah. I'm going to drop you an email right away. Yeah. I mean, someone had to think about that. I mean, if they have, obviously, it, someone I'm must doing have. it. Yeah, someone yeah, well, must have I'm done doing it, it then, then I'll drop you an email. <laughs> Perfect. Let me know what you see. And I don't think you should drink three Bloody Marys while you say her name. Just one. No, that's, yeah. that could be. Then you'll a definitely long see night. all kinds of things. <laughs> Yes, I'll be there. Hey, Rissa, I'm really seeing spirits. But how many Bloody Marys did you have, John? Three, four? <laughs> okay, right, well, right, there you right, go. right. <laughs> so the next superstition you asked me to talk about is changelings. And this is yeah. a super spooky one. Now, yeah. this dates back to into antiquity in both Europe and Africa. So both of those continents have this story, tradition, superstition. And it is a human-like creature, usually placed by some sort of supernatural entity instead of usually a baby or child, but sometimes a woman as well. So basically, it is a human stolen by a fairy or an elf or a dwarf mm. or some other kind of super supernatural entity and replaced with a, some supernatural entity that kind of looks like that person or child. Mm sometimes okay. looks identical to that person or child. So in a lot of the European tellings, especially the Irish tellings, which are definitely the ones you can find the most about, you can identify a changeling. And mm. I feel like some of these are, are giveaways. If, if your baby suddenly appears very sickly and doesn't grow at all, or if they have a beard or long teeth, <laughs> it could be a changeling. Yeah. They could also start talking too early, suddenly play a lute, or start displaying intelligence beyond their years. Mm. So I feel like the beard and the long teeth would pretty much seal the deal yeah, for give most that away. people. Yeah. <laughs> right? But some changelings apparently didn't were not that easy to pick out. And you mm. always had to worry about, you know, these supernatural creatures, especially Fae snatching up your baby child or your wife this was a serious concern in fact it was such a serious concern that it actually there was a a case in 1895 which is not that long ago in history there was a woman named bridget cleary she was mm. irish and her husband murdered her because he believed truly believed that she was a changeling yeah. Um, he set he he murdered her and then he set her body on fire. Ugh. He he testified that he believed his real wife yeah. had been abducted by the Fae and replaced with a changeling. He mm. said that he tried to force the Fae to return his real wife, but he was unsuccessful. So his only course of action was to murder the changeling. He mm. did in fact face arrest for his action. Yeah. Yeah. So, but people took um, this very, very seriously. Yeah. So, what's the difference between a doppel? Not that we have to get on this side topic at all. No, but doppelganger questions. versus changeling. Mm. Okay. A really good question. All right. Okay. So, a doppelganger is just like a double, and it could be a spirit yeah. double, not necessarily one that takes like solid form, like we are. Yeah. And doppelganger stories are actually surprisingly common. People yes. are like, oh, I just saw you in the kitchen. How did you get in the bedroom? You didn't walk yep. past me. And I kind of categorize doppelganger stories with ghost stories. Changelings, I categorize more with, how do I, you would almost say cryptid stories. Because mm. they are physical beings more than spirit entities. So that said, it's definitely, a, so like I said, um, definitely a difference between the spirit entity of a doppelganger and the physical entity of a changeling. Also, doppelgangers aren't always children and women. They can be anyone, even a pet. Mm. And yeah. where changelings are mostly kids and sometimes adult women. Now, changelings, uh, usually there's a reason that the fae or the other supernatural entities would go after a target. They could explain, like, it'd be extremely beautiful. Or they could be extremely intelligent or the fae or whatever entity might want it as a companion for some reason or servant. They believed a lot of people were snatched to become servants of the fae. 
And okay. a doppelganger, I would think, would be a totally different motive. A lot of people mm. believe doppelgangers have sort of dark motives, yeah. um, especially you hear so many stories, or at least I have, about a, a child hearing a doppelganger of a parent calling them away from yes. the house or calling them away from where their right. actual parents are, which feels a little ill-intentioned to me. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas with a changeling, there's ill-intention, but they're pretty directly just snatching your kid. Uh, yeah, there's, there's right? nothing. There's nothing else to say about it. It's just, yeah. they're, and they're going to leave you something they don't want <laughs> in exchange. Yeah, absolutely. Did, yeah. That was a long answer to your question. No, 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 no. I love it. I love it because I, I did just a little mini sewed on doppelganger. It's just I just got some stories, you know, just around Reddit and some other places. And you're right. It, it was very much like doppelgangers are. Hey, I saw you go into the bathroom and like i didn't go to the bathroom you know i've right. been downstairs taking a nap and like no i saw it or there was one story where there was a doppelganger trying to lead a a woman out into the wilderness right and These kinds of the, stories are definitely a thing and always depending where they are in the world i always kind of wonder if it's not something else because mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. also a of course, my mind just went blank, John. That's a thing that another known entity does. All right, yeah, there's... I know what you're thinking, too. Yeah, we'll have to... There are mimics as well. Mimics, yeah. Yes, mimics will do that, too. Also, there's another kind of cryptid out there that it's it is, known to do that. and I don't know that. my mind is just like... Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I, I Dairyland like, Fright... Like 30 pages of notes, and I can't remember. <laughs> Dairylandfrights at gmail.com. Help Rissa and I out. Send us an email. I'll be like, hey, it's this thing. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll be like, thank you. Perfect. <laughs> so, you know, there is action if you are concerned about changelings. Uh, there is action you can take to prevent the face specifically from snatching your baby. Now, okay. some of these are a little bit questionable. I do have concerns. But the number one thing is to leave iron in your children's bed, especially open iron scissors mm. i don't know that that's good advice um, no. i'm pretty sure that's not up to code with how uh, people want children to sleep um, no. <laughs> but that is a common charm okay. um, they also say to hang an upside down coat in the room where the child sleeps this is thought to ward off the fae this sounds like a way better idea than the iron scissors mm -hmm. yeah but also you could leave iron nails in their room again i think hmm. if you're going to do this make sure it's safe and far away from the kid maybe yeah. pound them in over the window or something like that right yeah but yeah the changeling situation uh you know historically was a pretty serious thing yeah people were very concerned about it yeah it sounds like it so the next thing that is on your list is hagstones so if people don't know what yeah. a hagstone is it is a stone that has a natural hole in the middle that it has eroded in such a way that I wish I had one with me, that it is a, a regular rock that's usually very smooth because water mm -hmm. erosion creates hagstones. And it okay. has a full circle in the middle that you can see through. Yeah. If you're lucky, you'll find them around riverbeds or beaches. And it's, of course, it's better to find your own. But I've seen them for sale on Amazon. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, that could be a plan B if you don't live near a riverbed or um, yeah, an ocean. Right. Sure. So, um, they're also called adder stones, and they have been used as a totem for many, many centuries. So, mm -hmm. if you find one, it is believed to have magical properties. It is mm -hmm. believed to be able to heal you from illness. But the big thing is being able to look through it. That is, okay. that is this magic that you can look through this rock. Yeah. Um, only good things can pass through the hole. So, mm -hmm. it is incredibly lucky to find one. And nothing evil or bad can come into it oh. if it's with you. So okay. you can definitely wear it near your heart. And it is another sort of shield against anybody doing evil spells or dark magic on you. And you could hang it over your front door so that no evil could come through. You could hang it over a window. I mean, maybe this would be a good totem against uh, changelings. I haven't tried it, but maybe. Yeah. And they say that it is definitely a good thing to keep on your person. You could hang it over where historically they would hang them over barns so that nothing could get the mm -hmm. livestock. 
that was a mm-hmm. you know super important and very valuable thing historically speaking to take care of your animals mm-hmm. if you get a lot of nightmares you could hang a hagstone over your bed so mm-hmm. you could sort of make it kind of like a dream catcher catches the bad yeah, dreams only the good yeah. stuff falls uh-huh. hagstone works in a similar way nothing bad can come through it so it uh-huh. can't find you if it's going to be filtered through the hagstone okay they also say that a fey cannot enter through the hole so oh. I, I'm, I'm yeah, going to go, go ahead and go in and, and support the idea that this is a good charm against a yeah. attack if that is a concern of yours. If yeah. anybody listening. Hmm. Love that. Yeah. But, you know, we also have the evil eye. The evil eye is yes. a super popular phenomenon right now. The thing is, it has been popular for more than 5,000 years. Talk <laughs> about trending. Yeah. It's been trending as long as people have known about it and it dates right. back probably to mesopotamia but nobody's sure because it goes back so far it, it's like rivaling written history it's that old mm. and it wow. definitely comes from somewhere in that part of the world in okay. uh, somewhere in like the middle east north africa somewhere in there but we don't know exactly where so hmm. if you're listening you're not sure what the evil eye is i'm talking about what we call the nazar N-A-Z-A-R. It is the blue circle with the black and white eye in the middle. And mm-hmm. if, as soon as I say that, probably everyone of your listeners can picture it. You see yeah. it on bracelets, on signs, on wind chimes, on hanging on people's trees, hanging on people's cars. Excuse me. You can find it on stickers now. I have seen it on Starbucks cups. <laughs> you don't Because you don't want evil to become, you know, into yeah. Starbucks, right? Yeah, so, your coffee. Come on. Heck no. So the evil eye is actually a charm against somebody throwing bad thoughts at you. Hmm. So this doesn't even have to be someone you know. I'm sure everybody listening will be familiar with the idea of casting the evil eye. We all do it. Everybody's done it. And yes. even if you're sitting there like, I would never, I bet you have. Yeah. It's like giving somebody a dirty look or even jealously right. looking at someone like, oh, my mm-hmm. gosh. Their house is so beautiful. I am jealous. Or, oh, my Mm -hmm. goodness, look at that beautiful, you know, outfit that person has on. Anytime you look at someone with jealousy, you look at someone with ill intention, you are casting the evil eye. This basically charm is to deflect it, to push it away. It's an amulet, really. And Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a return to sender charm, actually. (laughs) Okay. the idea is that the, if you wear the Nazar on your body or put it on your home or your car or your computer or your dog or whatever else, they are yeah. protected from these ill-intentioned thoughts coming at them. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's kind of an, an amazing magic, really, because when it breaks, it's been used. So oh. I have had the bracelets break. I have had my glass ones break. And I'm kind of like, well, I guess somebody was wishing bad upon me. And no. now it's time to get a new one. Yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, like I said, this date, this is a form of superstition or belief that nobody can prove it works, but it's yeah. awfully fascinating that it dates back so far in human history, yeah. way, way past times BC. Uh, I'm sorry, way past times AD, way past um, any modern religion we now have. The evil eye has been with us a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's super amazing to me, but we, <laughs> as a culture, we tend to like say, well, only witches can do it or gypsies yeah. or no, I mean, anyone could do it, right? Anyone could do it. I mean, I've been getting it a lot from my kids sometimes, <laughs> but I tell them, no, you yeah. can't have that. Maybe you should uh, in some of these charms for yourself, gotta, Jeff. I got to start doing that. I got to yeah. get a whole mess of them. And, and you know, everyone, and, and I love old movies too. And, you know, that, that's the thing, right? You see it in an old movie where there's this old lady and, and people are like making fun of her. And she's like, you lie kind of thing. And you're yeah. like, oh, no, it's, it's anyone could do it. It can happen from anywhere. Like you said, jealousy, envy. Whatever you want to say. Some negative content. Yeah. Have you ever been in traffic and said something horrible about a person you didn't know? Like, that person doesn't know how to drive. You just cast the evil eye on them. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a lot I hear, too, because I I listen to, like, some motivational books and stuff. 
from time to time, you know, just to make sure, you know, I, I, I suffer from depression. I've made that clear, I think, on, on my podcast many times. And, uh, you know, one of the things they'll say, not again, getting on the tangent here, but is if you put it out in the universe, it's going to come back to you. So if you put out negative feelings, mm-hmm. you negative feelings shall come back to you, put out positive feelings. And I, I think that's true with this per se, like maybe someone had some negative feelings, right? And your charm broke those, which is, if that works, that's great. <laughs> well, you know, John, I would tell you, I wouldn't tell you that I'm not superstitious, but I love these stories. I love yes. the evil eye. I love the Nazar. I probably yes. have a dozen different things that I own with the Nazar. I, you know, I don't own a hagstone because I've never found one. And there's a superstition yeah. right there. Why wouldn't I just buy one? I really want to find mine. I want one to find me. Right. So until one finds me, I won't have a hagstone. But I do have a whole lot of things with the Nazar, and I do wear one almost every single day of my life, even in the house. I I guess I am superstitious in that way, and I uh, there are a lot of superstitions. I'm like, no, that doesn't sound right. But this one, I know that people send out bad vibes because I live in the world, and I know that we're real human. And yeah. I mean, I would never purposely cut somebody off in traffic, but maybe I do. And maybe they throw the evil eye on me and my car. Sure. I keep one in my car, too. So <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that is great. I love I feel that. Like this is one of the most practical of all of the superstitions. Yes. And honestly, it's one of the oldest ones in my list. It literally touches almost every continent. This has some form of it. And mm-hmm. almost every major religion has embraced some form of it as well. Yeah. So there's got to be something to it. Kind of like yeah, you said, you know, what you put out is what you get back. But this evil lie is going to bounce it back right away. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, a good, what, it's a good superstition. It is. And I think it's a lot of people will probably say that's their number one. If there's a ranking of superstitions mm-hmm. that people believe, you know, that they get that a certain vibe or look or whatever, I, the people are like, hey, what, what's going on here and stuff. Have, John, right? have you ever been around a cat? They can definitely cast the evil eye. Yes, I have two. I have two cats and a dog. I, by the way, I have a black dog and, uh, and I have two cats. And yes, they, they will look, they will look at me sometimes like, Hmm. You know, it, it's really funny. I uh, I always like even if you're not a cat person, I I love cats, but I love animals in general. But like my, our cats know, and this is in the superstition, but our cats know when we're sick. Oh, like of course. they will sleep with us when I like I'm sick. Like they will cuddle up to us and just stay with me when I've been sick before. And oh, yeah. I, I just you know, they're, they're and I nursing just, you back to health. Right. Yeah, I just think that's kind of interesting. Oh, you know, giving that little evil eye for not, I don't know, stealing its catnip or <laughs> whatever's going on, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, when I teach this um, workshop about, I, I teach a workshop about the evil eye. And one of the pictures I use is a cat because I'm demonstrating yeah. like the evil eye doesn't have to come from someone who's envious of you, someone you know. It yes. can come from the cat that you love. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I, I just, yeah, again, like I said, I think that's one of the most superstitious things that people kind of would say, yeah, if I believe in anything, I believe in that. Mm-hmm. I, I, a- I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah. So let's try to get in a few more before our yeah. time ends. Yeah, you know, that'd be great. I, I, you could do like a whole year long series on superstitions. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. So let's talk about walking under a ladder. Yes. So before we begin on the superstitious side, I'm going to put out there the practicality of it. This is one that there is a practical side to it. It is just dumb to walk under a ladder. Yes, it is. If you are worried about a person on a ladder, hold it from the outside or the side. Don't hold it from underneath. And generally, don't walk under a ladder, especially if there's someone on it. That mm-hmm. is just not safe, and it is not a yeah. wise decision making. Yeah. So that is a thing about this particular superstition that is just true. It's yeah. true. Yeah. But that's not how it became a superstition. 
Hmm. It became a superstition from a much older story. We're going to go all the way back to the Egyptians and the story of Ra. Ra was represented by a triangle. And you should never break Ra's triangle, ever. Hmm. Because Ra was a, how do I say, short-tempered and vengeful god. Ra took no crap. So you don't ever want to break Ra's triangle. But then the Christians come along and they have the Holy Trinity. It's a triangle, once again. (laughs) And you never want to break the triangle. Don't break the triangle. So then the gallows comes along. And it creates a triangle once more. Yeah. Yes. So you don't want to get involved in that triangle either. So the ladder leaning against a building is indeed a triangle shape. The whole superstition has to do with not displeasing the gods by breaking the triangle or inviting yourself onto the gallows, which is what it evolved to over time. Yeah. So I have some ways to counteract this. this Okay, great. And I, I kind of, uh, I don't, I don't know if these are going to work or not. But your readers can, or not your readers, your listeners can let you know. Yeah. Walk backwards under the ladder to where you started. Now this could be unsafe. I highly advise people to be super careful if they do that one. Mm-hmm. Say bread and butter right after. I don't know. It seems pretty easy. Okay. Cross your fingers and keep them crossed until you see a dog, not your own. Oh. Spit on your shoe. If you accidentally walk under a ladder or okay. spit three times on the ladder. Hmm. There are a lot of customs with spitting in European countries that are very old. And some of these yes. curse counteract counteraction curses do come from those countries. So hmm. again, you could give it a shot. I don't know if it'll work. Yeah. <laughs> try. Let us know if you, if you work on walk under yeah. the ladder and you, uh, you're okay because you try one of these counter curses. Yes. I would love to hear that. <laughs> yeah. All righty. So we have just a little more time. So I'm going to just maybe pick a few of the ones that are remaining, if that works for you. Because I want to end on Absolutely. a tough note. It's yes. a sad note. And okay. um, if, it, if it's okay, before we go on to the up note, I'd like to do a little bit about graveyards because I did mention. Yes. It. Okay. Yes. So there are a lot of superstitions about graveyards. And the interesting thing to note is that graveyards, well, I should say cemeteries and graveyards aren't the same thing. A graveyard is at a church. It's a churchyard where people are Mm. buried. A cemetery is a freestanding burial ground. Cemeteries are a fairly new phenomenon. They came about in the 1800s, late 1700s or 1800s. And Mm. it's because churchyards or graveyards were too full. And they had to find more places to put dead people. Yeah. So that was a real problem, yeah. especially in cities. So cemeteries became these beautiful parks where they put dead people, where you could also mm. go during the Victorian era, especially, and like picnic with your dead family. Now, we think this is weird, but in other parts of the world, that is still a custom. Think of Dia de los mm. Muertos, for example. It is a revered holiday in Mexico and some other parts of Latin America to spend time with your ancestors. Yeah. So just because we Americans don't do it doesn't mean it's weird or abnormal. It's just not part yeah. of our belief system yeah. anymore. It used to be, but not anymore. Yes. Yeah. So the idea of standing on a grave or walking over a grave, yes. that is a common superstition. And that also comes to us from the Victorian era. And the problem was that a lot of times graves were left open overnight. So they would dig a grave and then leave it open. Oh, boy. And people would fall in and sometimes die or get very badly injured and not found right away. You just shouldn't, well, A, you shouldn't leave a grave open overnight. No. (laughs) Um, And the idea of stumbling into a grave is is pretty terrifying to most people. So uh, I guess watch where you're going. And yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, just this is the story, and it has a super practical answer to that superstition. Yeah, right. So in Japan, they cover their thumbs when they walk over into a cemetery or graveyard. Mm-hmm. And this is because the thumb and the word death literally translate to parent finger. Mm-hmm. So you don't want your parents to die. So you cover mm-hmm. your thumb when you, you tuck it in, when you enter any kind of burial ground if you're following this old Japanese superstition. 
I thought that one was very interesting. Yeah. Never heard of that. Yeah. Super, super fascinating. You don't want to uh, have any of anybody's parents have an untimely death, right? No. So cover your thumb. Gotcha. Headstones. So we have a lot of uh, belief around headstones. Their whole language is on headstones. Some of them are really beautiful. Headstones actually don't date back that far into history. Uh, Most people Mm. could have never afforded a headstone. Early headstones were made out of Mm. wood. And all of those are pretty much decayed and gone by now. So the headstones that we recognize uh, were literally placed to stop the deceased from getting out of their grave and walking away. People were historically very concerned about that. And there's there's so many stories about people being buried alive, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> that was a thing that definitely happened historically because we didn't know about the pulse. We didn't have modern medicine. Right. And sometimes people were just really sick or in a coma and they woke up already buried. I, I can't think of anything more terrifying personally. This is Ugh. the beginning of the, um, the bell in the cemetery. And they would put the bell on the outside yeah. of a grave and the cord would go down into the grave so you could ring it. And oh, know if you were still alive. I, oh, yeah. Yeah. Think that, that's, um, that's, that's a bit dark, right? That is very dark. <laughs> so um, there are even extreme accounts. When they didn't feel a headstone would keep you in your grave, um, sometimes they cut people's feet off in the 1700s <laughs> to make sure that you couldn't get up and walk out of your grave. Oh, wow. Okay. So you have to also remember that vampires were historically a, a worry. Um, yes. <laughs> They did not want their family to come back as a vampire. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that, that, was another, that was another concern. So the last cemetery story I think I'll do is about holding your bed. We yeah. talked about that a minute ago. And yeah. I could not find the origin of this, but a lot of experts believe this is because of the Hebrew word for breath and spirit. They are the same word. It is our R-U-A-C-H, Brach, I believe. I could be saying that wrong. So if you have a listener that knows, kudos. I don't speak Hebrew. I wish I knew how to say that word. But Mm. we're going to go with Brach. And it is the same word. So when you're in a cemetery and you're breathing, breath, spirit, breath, spirit, same word. You could breathe in a spirit and have Mm. it possess your body. And Mm. this is definitely a concern of people. Um, I have been told this superstition is practiced still. Like I've run into people who try to do it. And I'm like, well, I have concerns for your safety. <laughs> Perhaps you should. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, there is still very much a, a feeling that you could breathe in a ghost in a cemetery. Mm. Interesting. It is, uh, right? Uh, I have a question, though, and really in the superstitions, but. One of my spooky friends, she's not a paranormal investigator. Her name is uh, Gina. She's from She Haunts, and she loves cemeteries and graveyards. Oh, she yeah. She takes multiple pictures. Oh, yeah. She takes uh, all this time. Is there any superstitions if you spend, I don't know, a, a certain amount of time in them that a spirit might attach itself to you? Anything like that? I would have more concerns in a very haunted house than I would in a cemetery. I've been in a lot of cemeteries. They feel very peaceful to me, for the most part. If someone is lucky enough to be buried or remembered in a cemetery, they were loved enough Mm -hmm. or respected enough, at least, to be placed there. Sure, that makes sense. uh, This is my take on it. I I personally don't find cemeteries and graveyards to be spooky. I usually find them very restful. Now, there are Mm -hmm. some that have a different feeling. So I'm not saying they're all, you know, rainbows and, and unicorns. Um, <laughs> some definitely have a very different energy. Yeah. But for the yeah. most part, I think a yeah. lot of them are energetically very quiet places. And mm-hmm. um, it's a place where the dead are restful versus mm-hmm. places like a extremely haunted houses where the dead yeah. are not restful. Yeah. And I would be much more concerned about an attachment in a place where the dead are not restful. Yeah, Personally. that makes yeah, that makes total sense. So, yeah, okay. Just, yeah. I was just curious about that. Great. Yeah, that's that's my take on that. I mean, I'm yeah. sure that somebody can prove me wrong, and that's okay too. <laughs> I'm always yeah, willing exactly. to be wrong. Yeah, exactly. To learn more. That sounds <laughs> you know. That's always why we're here. 
So I thought for the last story for our hour together, I would do the Maneki Neko, which is the gold mm. beckoning cat. If you oh. have been into a lot of Asian restaurants and businesses, there's a cat yeah. sitting, yeah. waving its arm. And it's either <laughs> usually gold or white. Sometimes it's very ornate. It has a lot of yeah. decoration on it. And sometimes they even have an altar set out in front of it with like oranges or coins or other kinds sure. of offerings. Yeah. So this is from a real cat. I love this story. And it's a nice <laughs> uplifting way to go out All on right. the podcast. So the beckoning cat is uh, originally a Japanese figure believed to bring good luck. It, it, the real cat itself was a calico Japanese bobtail, and it was a legend that belonged to a Buddhist temple. Mm. So a man named Nakota was traveling during a storm, and he took shelter under a tree near this temple. He noticed Tama, T-A-M-A, the cat, and Tama kept raising a paw and beckoning mm. him to come towards the temple. Like, come here, come here, come here. Okay. And finally, he's like, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so curious. This cat is trying to get me to come into the temple. Even though it's starting yeah. rain, the cat's like, come on, come on. Yeah. So he did it. And as soon as he was away from the tree, a bolt of lightning hit the tree, destroyed mm. it. If he had been standing there, if the cat yeah. had not called him over, he would have died. Oh. So, uh, he was so grateful. He stayed at the temple for the rest of his life. He repaired it. He did work for them. And in 1697, it was named Gatoku Temple. And Tama, when she died, was buried there. Uh, she was placed in a special grave for cats. And they, they had a graveyard there for cats ever thereafter. There is a statue there of the Maneki Neko to commemorate Tama's service ever since. So... This story has evolved over time, and the beckoning cat has been become a good luck for businesses. You can also keep one in your home to kind of invite good luck and good fortune your oh. way as well. Okay. And uh, you can wear them. You can keep one in your, you know, wherever you work, maybe where you record your podcast. You could have one, you know, sort of beckoning the good luck towards you. I, I love this story. Mm. Um, ever since I learned more about it, beckoning you know, for a store, I'd be like beckoning customers. And, yeah. you know, I, I thought the story was so endearing and sweet. I was like, I, yeah. I'm going to probably have to get one of these little cats because yeah. I love the story and I, I like cats as well. So it became a good luck symbol for me too. And also just a cool art object to have in the house and to be able yeah. to talk about. Yeah, I, I love that. That's something that I've always wondered. Yeah. I thought it had something to do with must have something to do with luck or something Absolutely. and you know i'm just and just learning it now is just because you kind of feel strange about asking people hey what's this about you know and, and usually the only places i go into are either maybe like a shop but typically eating some chinese food i'll be honest <laughs> i just well, want to grab know, it you i know, first you saw know. them in chinese restaurants and i remember asking and literally yeah. a young lady goes i don't know it's just cute and I'm like, that can't oh, be right. Uh, yeah, like, that, that can't, can't be right. Be right. So yeah. Years later, I finally figured it out. And I, I, when I found the story about Tama, I, I just, I love the cat story. I love that she saved his life and that, you know, I then he that. stayed in service to the temple for the rest of his. So I thought this is a fantastic superstition. Yes. And I wish that everybody knew it. So uh, that's one reason I wanted to tell it today because it's, mm. it's such a good one. And it's, it's a kindness Yes, absolutely. Just ending on that is just uh, is great because it, it shows that not all superstitions are doom and gloom and you don't have to like walk around a ladder or backwards, and whatever, you know, and spit on something. Yeah, that, that sounds well um, advised. Walking backwards under the ladder, you just yeah, walk uh, right. Yeah, please don't do that. Uh, my spooky friends out there. Speaking of that, my spooky friends, if you have something, a superstition like Rissa's family about wedding cake mm -hmm. or something like that, please send an email to dairylandfrights at gmail.com or go to Instagram, Facebook, whether you go to Rissa or mine, and, and just tell us. You know, maybe there's some weird thing we've never heard of. Oh, maybe I love your it. I, I yeah, love hearing your, people's superstitions. Yeah. Yeah. In your culture, in your family. I do know tonight I got to do two things. One, I got to take my fan out of the bedroom and I got to move my mirror. 
So that's two things I got to do tonight before my soul goes away again. But I do see myself in the mirror. So I, I think I'm good. At least you're not a vampire. Yeah. 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 <laughs> sometimes I wish I was. You know, sometimes when you get older, you're like, damn, well, maybe, like, maybe I should have gone that route. Yeah. <laughs> I thought of go to the doctor and check me out all the time. Uh, but thank you so much. You're, again, this has been an incredible time. Please go to Tea and Smoke. I'm pulling up right now. Yes, Tea and Smoke dot com. Go in there. Hey, book a reading. Hey, ask her about things you are interested. Hey, you might want to shop. You might want to just find out some events that she's in the area that you would love for you to come to and say hi. And again, one of the things Rissa and I are trying to put together is something in October. And we're, well, we're not going to say yet, but it's going to be special one way or another because, you know, we just will both love paranormal. We love history, love talking about it. And, and so many great stories, especially, you know, with the, with the cat. I had no idea, you know, that, that is great. Anything else you want to share with my audience before we wrap it up? Uh, honestly, John, I'm, I'm just grateful that you had me. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you and to share with your listeners. That's, that's about yeah. it. All right. Well, thank you again. You know, always love to have you on. You're welcome back anytime. Like I tell my listeners, we say, say hi to your ghost. Because you might have a ghost. Even that, that might be a superstition. Well, Maybe I don't know. I think ghosts super- get lonely, too. Yeah, so say hi to him. And obviously, like I say all the time, stay spooky. Thanks, Rissa. Thank you. We'll talk later. (laughs) Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Hello, my spooky friends. This is John, your host of Dairyland Frights in the spookier podcast, Nightland Frights. And I wanted to thank all my spooky friends out there for listening. I truly appreciate it. Please like and subscribe and rate us five stars. It helps you make this a better podcast. And make sure you comment uh, what guests you would like me to have on, what topics you would like me to talk about. It only going to make this podcast better. So again, thank you so much for listening, and please go to my Patreon, check that out, uh, become a Parascani for only $3, a spooky friend for a dollar. And remember, stay spooky.